Good morning and welcome to Newsmakers. This Tuesday is primary day in Kentucky. For 24 years, Senator Wendell Ford, after 24 years, Senator Wendell Ford will retire at the end of the, this year. Only one Republican has declared their candidacy for the seat, Northern Kentucky Congressman Jim Bunning. On the Democratic side, however, three people are engaged in a heated contest to win the right to challenge Bunning. You will meet all three right here on Newsmakers this morning. Two of the candidates are with me for the first segment of the program. Congressman Scotty Bassler could not be here because of a schedule conflict, but we sat down together 10 days ago. You will hear that interview during the second part of the program. In the first part of the show, I am joined by two of the candidates in this three-way race. Charlie Owen is a lawyer and businessman from Louisville. Steve Henry is the current Kentucky Lieutenant Governor. He is an orthopedic surgeon who has practiced in Louisville. Welcome to Newsmakers. And it's good, good to be, to be uh, we try to do a lot of Kentucky things on this show and because our, we, we uh, have a lot of viewers over in Kentucky. But I got to tell you, we have a lot of Ohio viewers too who may not be familiar with you and maybe some Northern Kentuckians aren't all that familiar. familiar. So I'd like to ask you at the beginning, uh, and just to start uh, with you, um, to give a brief background as it, re your background, as it relates to what you think makes you eligible to become a U.S. Senator. Charlie? Well, Dan, I, uh, first of all, was raised in Lexington, Kentucky, and uh, I went from there to Princeton University and Virginia Law School, was a federal prosecutor, came home to Kentucky, ran the Kentucky Crime Commission for seven years. We really uh, made government work during that period of time. What, what sorts of things did you do with the Crime Commission? Well, let me describe briefly for you. Yeah. We rewrote all the criminal laws of Kentucky for the first time in the state's history. We trained all the police when the police were not being trained, and we established the program that exists to this day. We started the public defender, the medical examiner, um, <coughs> centralized police labs, and ultimately changed the way we elected judges by changing the Kentucky Constitution. All of those things were done in a period of seven years, and I think we built a consensus among Democrats and Republicans to move the state forward. Uh, I'll take that same kind of attitude to Washington in the U.S. Senate. I think I've proved I could make government work. And then for the last 20 years, I went out, started practicing law, and, and then uh, basically ran my own businesses. And I've built uh, a good number of businesses now, and I've made my businesses work, I think, as successfully as I made the, pri uh, the public sector work. And I really want to return to public service. I found that both rewarding to myself, and I think it's a, a good use of my life if uh, the voters decide to send me. Okay. Uh, Steve, what about you? Give a brief, uh, just a brief background. Well, I, I basically uh, grew up in western Kentucky. I grew up in Owensboro, and uh, oddly enough, grew up in Wendell Ford's home. As a very young boy, his son and I were best friends. And, uh, Wendell and, and Bill Natcher and those types of folks actually got me in politics. Uh, what I have done is uh, stayed in politics, uh, basically got, as I got out of medical school, got out of residency, uh, I started uh, my practice at a charity hospital and donated a significant part of my life to a charity uh, taking care of the, the indigent in the Louisville area. Uh, but then got involved in politics because I was a neighborhood president and got more and more involved because of the issues that I was concerned about. And I think that's one of the things that best prepares me, uh, having been in health care, having seen all the problems that we've had in our society over the last uh, 20 years. Uh, every day that I'm in the emergency room, I treat uh, gang violence, or I'll treat domestic violence, or I'll treat uh, uh, drunk drivers, or innocent victims who've just gotten in the, the harm's way somehow. Uh, and I think that uh, allows me to have that different perspective in the United States Senate. And I think uh, as we look today, one of the biggest problems we have in our society is health care. And I'm going to make sure that... Uh, what would you... A lot, there's a lot of concern, and recently there's been a lot of concern in northern Kentucky with HMO and certain... HMOs and certain... Uh, insurance companies and how they're handling doctors. What would you propose happening? Well, it's not just handling doctors. It's handling people. Okay. It's, 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 it's profits above people. And we've got to make sure that we have a basic Bill of Rights. And, and I'm, I'm, not gonna, I'm not here to criticize my, my opponents, but I came out with this. I've been talking about a Bill of Rights. I mean, my, Concretely, my, what would those Bill of Rights be? Well, basically, let you choose your own doctor. Let the doctor determine when you go to the hospital and when you leave the hospital, not some bureaucrat or an insurance company, making sure that pediatric, our children have specialists that treat uh, uh, 
children, making sure that women have the right to go to a woman doctor, I mean, or, or a doctor who takes care of women's issues. Uh, today we're having problems with drive through mastectomies. A woman that has breast cancer and has her, her breast removed has to go home the same day. It's outrageous. We've got people in Kentucky that uh, their closest hospital, their closest doctor, for instance, in Owensboro, is Lexington and Louisville. And what they're doing, that they're, they're profiting by the way they're designing the health care system so that you can't access it. They're restricting care and rationing care. And can that be changed by federal legislation? Oh, absolutely. Okay. Absolutely. Uh, Charlie, what about you on, on health care reform? Well, first of all, the Patient Bill of Rights is uh, something that uh, all of us, the three of us, major candidates in the Democratic primary have signed on to. Now, there are some differences uh, in what we've each called for. But uh, that bill and that idea of a patient bill of rights really originated in the Congress. Uh, there's a uh, Norwood D'Amato bill is the principal one in the Congress. It's been there a long time. It didn't originate with Steve, and, and as he knows, but, but we have all basically said we've got to have a better system of relationships between patients any and healthcare providers. Any significant difference between your position and what uh, Steve just outlined? Well, uh, there is some. Uh, I, I am running a campaign that's really free of special interest. I'm able to do that because I've uh, worked for 20-some years in businesses. I've, I've achieved a certain independence. I'm not going to be a narrowly focused candidate. I'm going to have a broad-based view of what needs to be done for the people of Kentucky. And uh, when it comes to specifically health care, uh, the, the Bill of Rights that I suggested would have required doctors uh, to disclose any conflict of interest they had, any interest they had in recommending certain treatments. Steve's did not, although I believe he's, you've now agreed that that should be included. And, and other than that, um, because Steve is backed by many doctors uh, or has raised money from them, I have not. And I think that's one indication of, of the fact that being free of special interests is something that's important. It will give me an independence that I believe will serve Kentucky well. I want to move on to a lot of other issues, but I also want to give you a chance. Well, is, is this special interest issue a concern as a I, doctor? I'm, I'm very much a, a special interest candidate, no question about it. I mean, I know Charlie's taken money from cable uh, interest, and I think Charlie King gave you money. I, I believe that's correct. I don't think that's right. We'll, 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 <laughs> we'll, we'll check after the show, but the point I'm making is, is, is I have a vested <coughs> interest, and my vested interest is our patients. And the physicians of this uh, country are helping me uh, because of this one fact. They can no longer take care of their patients. They can't get them in the hospital. They can't do surgeries when they need to do surgeries, and they can't take care of them. Now, there is one major difference between myself and all the other candidates that they haven't even talked about. I'm going to protect the senior citizens of this country. The Congress right now is talking about putting them under HMOs and managed care. I'm going to fight it every step of the way. My 93-year-old grandmother in Beaver Dam, Kentucky, would lose the same doctor she's had for the last 30 years, have to change the hospital that she goes to because they generally contract out to larger hospitals, and there's not one in Beaver Dam or in rural Kentucky hospitals. No one else is talking about senior citizens, and no one else in any of their uh, legislation has talked about keeping them out of it. I'm talking about keeping our senior citizens free of HMOs. Uh, quick response. Well, Do you have a problem with that? Well, uh, first of all, I've taken no special interest money. I've said I won't take any PAC money, I won't take any money from lobbyists. Yeah, but what about this That's issue about senior citizens? Now, now, on senior citizens, there's no question. We've all spoken out on senior citizens, the, whether, you, whether you're concerned with Social Security, which we want to... Uh, but what about on this HMO question? And the HMOs, uh, we have all agreed that the HMOs have to be improved. Their performance is, is questionable at this point. But in relationship and to senior citizens and we, we, choice of doctors? And the things Everyone that, that has Steve signed on to the choice of doctors and okay. so forth. I don't want to get stuck uh, in this. There's another... Well, well, let me just say this. All right. The fact of the matter is we had a debate the other night and no one else is out front on the senior citizen issue about keeping them out of HMOs. No one has taken that position okay. except myself. I'm going to leave that right there. Okay. We, there's another issue that cuts in Kentucky in a lot of different ways and that is tobacco. Uh, Charlie, where do, and, and I have to tell you, although I, I didn't show you the interview that uh, Congressman Vassler did, you know, he is a tobacco farmer and, you know, claims that much like you're a doctor, he says, I'm a tobacco farmer, I have the best understanding of this thing. What's your view on the McCain bill and what Congress should be doing? Not all this, not the theoretical stuff, but what, what Congress and Senate can, can do. Well. <clears throat> it's true that Scotty uh, has, uh, is uh, 
focused on tobacco much as Steve is focused on health care. <coughs> Excuse me. And, uh, um, and I am a broader based candidate, I think, because of the business background. Now, the fact is that on the McCain bill, I, ha I have said all along uh, that what we need is to protect the price support and the quota system in Kentucky. The small family farms will be terribly impacted if we lose it. As of two days ago, Senator McConnell, the junior senator, uh, has basically walked away and has supported Senator Luger with a buyout. And the biggest issue. And as I understand here, Luger's proposal, it's a it's a uh, buyout where the farmer doesn't have much choice. They, they'll well, have to sell out. Is that's that correct? Right. That's right. And then everyone goes on the world market, and the price of tobacco is going to go from something like one ninety a pound to one thirty a pound. And the small family farmer then cannot make it. We happen to be small family farmers. My mother has a farm in Bourbon County, and uh, I used to go work there every summer. Uh, we cannot make it with three and a half acres of tobacco, and most of the small family farms, it's estimated we will lose the, at least half of them in Kentucky if the price support and quota system goes out and we all go on the world market. Now, it doesn't have to happen, but whether you include Senator Ford's LEAF Act is the critical point. Senator McConnell walked away from the LEAF Act. I support the LEAF Act of Wendell Ford, and, uh, and I think it's crucial that we have leadership that will allow these small family farms to continue. Well, absolutely. I think that uh, Scotty, as well as all of us, is taking the leadership of Wendell Ford. And Scotty's not taking the leadership, and that's why some of the largest tobacco farmers in Kentucky are supporting my campaign. Bill Kegel, one of those, uh, has one of the, the biggest bases in Kentucky and has warehouses and is the co-chair of my campaign. So you know where I stand on agriculture. But let me say this. Uh, so what, or what, what you're saying is, what I'm hearing is that essentially the three of you in this race are essentially in the same place on this issue. I think we're in the same place except for this. Scotty Bazer is not taking the leadership that needed to be taken over the last six years in Congress and it is under his watch that this has happened. And I think he's going to bear some of the responsibility. That's why some of the farmers are, are now starting to actively oppose him. Uh, but let me say this, last week we offered as best we could because my our family farm was 88 acres and you can't do much with 88 acres and so we uh, have proposed a small uh, family Farm Tax Relief Act, which is $3,000 for a family farm of 150 acres or less to try to make it profitable to have a small family farm because we're losing them at a, at a very alarming rate in Kentucky. We're going to have to do something to help the, the small uh, family farmer. Let me tell you just how, how uh, I agree with that and, and tell you how far out of whack uh, Washington has gotten on this question. We have a $516 billion settlement under the McCain Act. If it were to pass. Uh, the lawyers want a third of that. Right. And maybe they'll get 10 percent or 20 percent, whatever it may be, 50, 100, or 150 billion dollars. Senator Ford's LEAF Act only provides 28 billion for the farmers. Senator McConnell walked away the other day and went to 18 billion for the farmers in a buyout and giving up the price support system. I'm telling you something's out of whack when we're having this huge transfer of wealth to the lawyers and in fact not protecting the farmers who have done absolutely nothing wrong but raise a, a legitimate crop and and that is the way they've made their living and it has such a huge effect on Kentucky okay another issue those of us uh, or in my case grew up in northern Kentucky but people who live in northern Kentucky sometimes feel like they're between a rock and a hard place you know from Cincinnati from fourth and vine they're looked at as part of Kentucky and from Louisville Lexington <laughs> Frankfurt they're looked at as the southern suburbs of Cincinnati. If you're the senator from Kentucky, what are you going to do to pay attention to northern Kentucky and deal with northern Kentucky issues? Well, I think just what we've done. I mean, uh, every time Delta sneezes, we're up here helping them at every turn. Uh, it's at least once every two months I'm up here for a major Delta pro project or announcement. Uh, I think that uh, it, being in a hard spot is not so bad. Northern Kentucky is booming. And we feel like that our administration has been a tremendous asset to, for, for this area. And look at all the, the uh, location of national uh, and international homes uh, for corporations here. Uh, Kentucky, if you compare the rest of the, the country with Kentucky, we're doing very well with, uh, with new uh, manufacturing jobs, with new uh, 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 
businesses coming in from Japan, one of the best in the country as far as the record. The governor has sent me on uh, a number of trade missions to India, I've been with him to Japan and China, and we are very proud of the way this uh, is working out for Northern Kentucky. Charlie, what about you in Northern Kentucky? In Northern Kentucky, I've had a long history uh, up here, first uh, running the Crime Commission um, and trying to see that all the police got trained and the rest of the things that we did. And then uh, later, uh, I was here uh, early on in, in bringing cable television to, to Northern Kentucky. And uh, so I, I know a lot of people here and have had a business uh, what relationship. What about from a political sense if you're in the uh, Senate? What well, can you do? <clears throat> what I'm trying to convey is that I've, I've been involved in Northern Kentucky both governmentally and from a business standpoint for over 25 years. I think it is the most entrepreneurial part of Kentucky. At this point, it has a lot to teach the rest of Kentucky. It, a lot has happened because of the airport. And uh, uh, nevertheless, it, it is one of the areas that I want to emphasize because I have come out with a, a fiscal responsibility and economic development plan. And it is absolutely true that, that Northern Kentucky can provide this leadership around its universities, all three of the universities at Louisville and Kentucky and NKU. And we need to have more high tech we need to spin off businesses out of there. We need to give them the incentives <coughs> for it. We can continue to, our, to attract our manufacturing base, but venture capital will most likely come right here through Northern Kentucky for the rest of the state. Okay. I, they're talking in my ear, and I hate to do this to you because I'm going to ask you an explosive question, but we only got a minute and a half left here. In Northern Kentucky, a very important issue up here is the abortion question, mm -hmm. particularly partial birth abortion, which is, comes before the Senate and House. I'm going to ask both of you to ask, answer very succinctly where you stand on each of these issues. Uh, uh, partial birth abortion as a physician, if it's a normal uh, child, a normal baby, it should be delivered. Uh, only in the, the bizarre situation in which the fetus is so abnormal it would never survive and in the health where the mother is in some risk of her life. And where do you stand generally on and that's And that's the position of all the OBGYN physicians who don't perform abortions, that's their position as well. And what about the uh, question of Roe versus Wade generally? Well, personally, as a physician, I would never perform an abortion, but uh, I, this is my position. I think that that should be a decision between, as government says, we should not be involved in it, but it should be between the, the physician, the patient, and the clergy. Okay. And I oppose partial birth uh, abortion, and uh, it's a very personal issue with me, uh, Dan, because I, I was adopted. I, I oppose abortion. I, I I don't mind if someone says uh, they gave me a chance at life and, and this is a, a good choice. At the same time, the government, uh, for all of that, this is a, a very personal issue with me and I do oppose it. Um, I can't see the government being more able than the mother and the community to decide what she individually should do. So uh, on the question of Roe versus Wade, you support that position staying in place but you're opposed to abortion personally? That's correct. Is that correct? Okay. And you would vote against partial birth abor abortion? Yes. Okay. Thank you very much for being with us, and we'll be watching closely next uh, Tuesday night. All right. Thank okay. you thank for you. having us. Okay. Having Stay us. right there. Stay tuned. After the break, I will have an interview with Congressman Scotty Bassler, the third candidate in the Democratic primary for Senate. Welcome back. The third person in the Kentucky Democratic par primary for the U.S. Senate is Congressman Scotty Basler. We sat down with him 10 days ago. Here is the interview. Congressman, there's a lot of people in our Ohio audience and maybe a lot of people in northern Kentucky who don't know you that well. What's your background, particularly as it relates to being a United States Senator? Uh, first of all, I've lived on the same farm I've born on in Fayette County for the last 56 years. So. Uh, basically, when I talk about the rural area of Kentucky, I probably come from a pretty good standing. I still raised a bike. I still raised a goal there. Graduated from the University of Kentucky, where I played basketball with Coach Rupp for four years. I was mayor of Lexington for 11 years, and I've been in Congress now for the last six years. One of the biggest issues in the Congress right now, and certainly for Kentuckians, is the whole issue of tobacco reform and the, and the McCain bill. Where do you stand on the McCain bill, and where do you stand in general on what ought to be done in the area of tobacco? I'm the only tobacco farmer in Washington, so I probably know as much about this as anybody. And, and I think the, from the farmer's perspective, we need the provisions that are in Ford's bill, the bills I've filed in the House that uh, Jim Bunning had to be on my bill too, and that is you've got to make sure to give the farmers the opportunity 
to sell out if they want to uh, voluntarily, not mandatorily, but voluntarily. And for those who want to stay in, we need to maintain the tobacco program as we know it. Given that, what do you think will be, in the end, the result of the negotiations about some sort of tobacco settlement? Where will this all end up some months down the road? I want the communities with which the farmers live, the farmers, and I want people who want to raise it to be able to raise it under the tobacco program. That's the number one priority. Maintain the tobacco program as we know it today, so if you raise tobacco in Kentucky, you can make a profit, and so people in Texas can't raise it. I think we'll have it settled. I think something will happen this year, because both political parties need it. Because if either one of the political parties look like they're trying to stonewall it, I think the public will eat them alive, because we have got to address the underage smokers. Mitch McConnell has led the fight to prevent any sort of limitation on campaign finance reform. What's your position on campaign finance reform, and what have you done to carry out your position? I think you've got to have some campaign finance reform to give people back the opportunity to participate in the lecture process, lecture, uh, lecture process. If we don't ban soft money and put some disclosure on where independent groups get their money, then the public is going to be left out of the process. The agenda of the United States Congress is set by people who give large amounts of uh, money to one of the parties. Big money is running the show. Big money is pushing it. That's what the agenda is set for. You know, I don't think it's by accident that between January 1st this year and, and April 1st this year, when we're talking tobacco right now, $200,000 was given to the Republican Party by one of the tobacco manufacturers as a, as a contribution. I don't think it's an accident. You know, northern Kentucky has always sort of been between a rock and a hard place. People in Lexington, Frankfort, and Louisville look on it as the southern suburbs of Cincinnati, and Cincinnatians look on it as just part of Kentucky. Where does northern Kentucky fit in to the bigger picture of Kentucky? You first thing you've got to understand one thing. Northern Kentucky is one of the strongest economic engines the state of Kentucky has as a whole. You've got to realize that quickly. Was well, because of the airport, was the university, all the businesses are located in here, where you have where the international uh, international markets of the world can focus here because of the airport and other transportation. So the first thing is center to you understand you've got to keep that economic engine going. So if I'm the United States Center, Senator, anything I can do is to make sure the economic engine of Northern Kentucky goes, I will do it. Does it mean roads? Two or three weeks ago I voted for Best T, which is a, means more funding for Kentucky's roads. One of the hottest issues in Kentucky, and especially in northern Kentucky that has a large Roman Catholic population, is the abortion issue. Where do you stand on the issue of partial birth abortion and what the federal government should be doing about that? On a partial birth abortion, I voted to override the president's, I voted for the ban and to override the president. I, I think that's pushing the envelope too far. Uh, on on uh, Federal funding for abortion, I do not support federal funding for abortion. On, a, on whether or not you can get an abortion under Roe versus Wade, I support. So I'm more pro-choice on that side. On family planning, I voted to fund family planning type of activities. Uh, so the reason I explain that to you, there's just not one vote you have up there. You have a lot of votes, and, uh, 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 and folks who are usually 100% on that issue of, of, of pro-life, they probably won't like my position as much. But I think it's been very consistent, and that's where it is. The whole area of health care, it touches people's lives very directly. And in northern Kentucky, there have been some real problems for certain doctors with certain HMOs and certain plans, insurance plans. What do you think the federal government should be doing now and in the future in the area of health care reform? I'm a co-sponsor of the Patient Bill of Rights. There's two of them in Congress now. I'm a co-sponsor of, of both of them. The doctor needs to be able to make the choices on what kind of health care the patient needs. He shouldn't have to call the insurance company in Atlanta, wherever it is, and say, can I do X? The second thing is, in, in a lot of HMOs, you've got to have the provision that if you, all of them should be, allow people, to, if the kids got to go to the emergency room, should be some coverage. Third thing, there shouldn't be a gag rule. If you're if you are if you are in uh, an H if you're in a, hospital, a doctor's office and he knows you need something else that's not covered with HMO, he shouldn't be prohibited or encouraged not to tell you about it. Nothing touches people's lives more directly than Social Security. What do you think the federal government should do to secure and buttress Social Security for the future? What I think we have to do first on Social Security, without question, is we're going to have a surplus this year. Let's put the surplus in the, let's use the surplus to buff up the Social Security fund, beef it up. 
What about these proposed private investment funds? We've got to be real careful here because some people are not going to have the ability to invest as other people, so you're going to have an a, a, a unequal uh, uh, return, and maybe that's okay to a point. But if you know, a Social Security fund itself takes care of divorcees, widows, and other things. Most of these privatization programs you're talking about don't do that. So it's going to be, it's going to be something we can look at, obviously. But let's don't get carried away here, and let's look at it for a while before we jump off the jump jump off the roof. The Kentucky primary is this Tuesday, May the 26th. Be sure to vote. Thanks for being with us.